So now we're going to be talking about forces. The uh, variable that I'm going to use for forces is going to be uh, just a capital F. And the unit for a force is going to be called a Newton, which is just a capital N. And it's named after Isaac Newton, who is the person who developed this framework. So Newton's laws, there are three of them. And these are what govern how forces work and why we need them. So the first one is inertia. And I'll, each one of these will have their own slide where I explain what they are. Two is this equation, which maybe you've seen before, F equals MA. And the third law is that the force of one object acting on a second object is the same as the force of the second object acting on the first object. So we'll talk about each of these three laws, but this is a, a quick way to write them all down. So let's talk about the first law. So Newton's first law in terms of, so we wrote it down as inertia, but now what does inertia mean? In kind of word form, it's an object in motion will stay in motion or an object at rest will stay at rest until acted on by an external force. Okay, so if something is moving, it's gonna keep moving unless there are some forces involved. And if something is at rest, it's gonna stay at rest until some force acts on that object. Okay, so now what is a force? So that's what Newton's second law is talking about. So what is a force? So the equation for a force, which we saw was F equals MA. And so this is a kind of an approximate form of this equation. Uh, because the real equation involves calculus, but for a lot of situations and for this class, this is a good enough uh, equation to use. So if we look at this equation, so the left side is force, And on the right side, we have mass and we have acceleration. 
So a force, one way to think about a force is something that gives an object an acceleration. Uh, so we've already seen one force in this class. Uh, do you guys know what that is? Gravity, right. So we saw that the acceleration due to gravity was G and that was negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And so the force that is associated with gravity, I write as F sub G, and that would be M times G. Then you have to know that this negative sign is gonna go with it. And this, uh, because I'm writing these little arrows over the force, that means that force is a vector. So if you remember uh, all the things that we could do with vectors, right? They had their special rules, adding them together. You had to do, uh, say, Pythagorean theorem or break it into components and then add those components together. Uh, so all of those rules apply to forces as well. Uh, and a little, in a few minutes, I'll introduce some other forces that you have probably heard or used in your everyday life. And then we'll see how to build a framework of those uh, using Newton's laws. So any questions about the first or second law so far? Okay. Now the third law. Is pretty interesting and there are some interesting conceptual things that go along with it. So I wrote down this equation, the force of object one acting on object two is the same as the force of object two acting on object one. So what does that mean? So another way that this is written is uh, for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. If you wanna think about an example of this, let's say we had two people and they were sitting on these kind of rolly office chairs like I'm sitting in now. And I know this is impeccable artwork. So if we call this person one and this person two, if person one pushes off of person two, then, so person one pushes person two. We'll assume that both of their legs are up in the air, so they're not, their feet aren't touching the ground. So, based on this law, uh, what do you guys think is going to happen to both person one and person two? They'll both move, right? So it's not just because person one is the one doing the force doesn't mean that only person two moves. Person one is also going to move. So Newton's third law is gonna be important uh, when you start doing things like if there's more than one object in the problem you're trying to solve. Uh, for example, you might be given the force of Let's say there's two blocks sitting next to each other. And you're pushing on block one with some pushing force. So you're pushing on block one. Block one is going to be pushing on block two. 
But then because of this law, we also know that block two has to push back on block one. So we'll see some examples of that later on, but uh, just keep this in mind when you're solving problems that have multiple uh, objects interacting with each other. Okay, so those are Newton's three laws. So let's see some examples from stuff we've already worked on. So we've already done projectile motion. And when we were doing that, we always were saying that the acceleration in the y direction is negative 9.8. And that was due to gravity, we said. And we've now learned that the force of gravity is going to be mg or negative 9.8 times the mass. And that's going to be directed in the y direction. So we'll write a j hat. So once our projectile had been launched at whatever initial velocity, through its whole motion, there's only one force acting on that object. And so let's say that we had a ball that we were launching that has some mass m. If we wanted to know the force of gravity, let's say that the mass is two kilograms. Then the force of gravity acting on that ball would be negative 9.8 times two and that would be 19.6 Newtons. And another thing, uh, so something I forgot to mention, uh, so the units for acceleration are meters per second squared, and the units for mass are kilograms. And so the unit of one Newton is equal to one kilogram meter per second squared. And this should be a vector still. So it should be negative. And then we need to specify that this is in the y direction. Okay. So something that we're going to be doing to help us keep track of all of the forces in our equations or in our problems are going to be is something called a free body diagram. And so if we take the example of a projectile, like we just saw, you take your mass m, you can draw it as just a point, or you can draw it as a circle, or you can draw it as whatever shape you think it is. And then on this object, we draw our forces as vectors. So the force of gravity is pointing straight down. So we draw an arrow for the force of gravity pointing down like that. And so for one force, that's not super complicated, but when we start adding more forces, it's gonna be very important to draw these three body diagrams to keep track of all of your forces. Okay, so now 
let's start introducing some courses that maybe you haven't seen before and some maybe you have. So that work that we just did was for a projectile, but what if something is just, for example, sitting on top of a table? So is gravity going to be acting on this object? Yeah, so, and let's say it has mass m. So gravity is always acting on things that are on the Earth. So we know that there has to be some gravitational force that's pulling down on this object. Now, if we think about our Newton's laws, the first law said that an object at rest will stay at rest, and an object in motion will stay in motion unless acted on by a force. So right now we have a force acting on this object, but we know that things can just sit on top of tables or anywhere and not start moving randomly, right? So we need another force that is going to counteract this gravitational force. And that's gonna be called the normal force. And I write it as an F with a little subscript N. So the normal force is basically the force of either the ground, if you're standing on the ground, or a table, if something is sitting on the table. And that is that force is pushing upwards, or I shouldn't say upwards, I should say pushing perpendicular to the surface. of whatever uh, uh, the object is sitting on. So if, if something is sitting on a horizontal table like this, then perpendicular to horizontal is straight up. So another word that people use for normal force, which I am not going to be using is weight. So if you think about a, if you stood on a scale, you would have pretty much this picture, right? You would be standing on top of something, gravity would be pulling down and normal force would be pushing up on you. So the weight that that scale is reading sometimes, uh, or the, the weight that that scale is reading is the normal force. And so some textbooks or something that you might see online will call it the weight. Uh, I'm not gonna do that. I'm just gonna call it the normal force. So this gets into an interesting, uh, a couple of interesting conceptual uh, questions. So if we said that the weight is equal to, or I guess before we do that, uh, let's do a different conceptual question first. Uh, so if this is the earth and you're standing on top of the earth and you've got your force of gravity pulling down on you, and you've got your normal force of the ground pushing back on you because you're not falling through the earth and you're not flying off into space. Which, uh, is the force of the earth on the person 
and compare that to the force, I guess no vector, just the magnitude, the force of the person on the earth. So is one gonna be bigger than the other? Are they gonna be the same? Okay, so some people think one is bigger than the other. Some people think same. Uh, so this is gonna be the same. So this is Newton's third law. And if you thought they were different, then that's a pretty common thing that people think. So I wanted to explicitly show this example. So uh, Newton's third law applies to all of these forces. So even though the earth is bigger than you are, so you might think, oh, the earth is gonna exert more force on me. Uh, but because of Newton's third law, we know that those forces have to be equal. We've seen Newton's laws and the one that involves most of the math is Newton's second law. So we saw that it was F equals MA. And so if, if there's only one force, then you can do this. But if there's multiple forces, like a block sitting on a flat surface, then when you draw your free body diagram, you know that there are two forces, gravity and the normal force. But when there's more than one force, this uh, Newton's second law becomes a sum. So basically, if I take the normal force and the gravitational force, then I get MA. So one of the ways to write that is with this symbol, which is like a, a rotated M, uh, but this is a symbol that means summation. And so you can write sum of the forces equals MA. And then another way to write that is the net force equals MA. And so this net force is just the result of adding up all of your other forces. So if you see something with F net, then that's just the, means the same thing as the sum. And so in practice, what this looked like for something on a flat surface, so if we have our sum of the forces, this MA, and we wrote that our two forces are normal force and gravitational force. So now we recognize that both of these are in the Y direction. So when I put in the the vector, uh, sometimes I'll just write, I know the normal force is pointing up, so that's positive, and the gravitational force is pointing down, so that's negative. So if I do, if I'm writing with vectors, with a vector hat, uh, the vector hat is including the direction, and then if I don't write the vector hat, then I need to include a plus or a minus in front of the force, so you know which direction it's pointing. Okay, so now we recognize that this thing is just sitting here. So if it's stationary or static, then the acceleration equals zero. And so the right-hand side of our equation just goes to zero. And if we solve for the normal force, then 
we see that it equals the gravitational force, which is mg. And if you were given a mass, say 10 kilograms, then you could calculate this to be 10 times 9.8, which is 98 newtons. And so in, in this situation where the mass is just sitting still and it's on a flat surface, then this normal force is the weight of the object. But this is only when on a flat stationary surface. And so we're going to continue doing stuff in one dimension for a few minutes, and then we'll move on to uh, two dimensions, which is what you were working on on the worksheet yesterday. So any questions about this so far? Yeah. Uh, so here. Okay, so uh, basically, I so we know that forces are vectors, right? So I'm kind of skipping some steps, and I'm saying that this normal force vector we know is going to be some magnitude, and it's directed in the plus y direction. Then for the gravitational force, we know that it's some magnitude and it's going to be some magnitude, and it's in the negative y direction. So now, because I know that everything is in the y direction, when I add these two vectors, I could keep writing the, the i hat or the j hats to be consistent, but I'm lazy, so I don't do that. So basically, I just pull the minus sign out from in front of the j hat, and then I just don't write the j hats because I'm lazy. But if you want to be very careful so you're keeping track of everything, then you can do it this longer way. So any other questions? So this was when this object was sitting on just the stationary thing. But now let's think about uh, what if we have this same 10 kilogram box, but now we put it in an elevator. And now we ask, what is the normal force if the elevator is moving at in different situations? So let's take case A. Let's see. So maybe we'll start. So for part A, we'll start on the ground and start moving upwards. at an acceleration of one meter per second squared. Then for part B, we'll, uh, so after we've accelerated, we'll move at a constant velocity. Then for part C, once you get to 
whatever floor you want to go to, you have to stop. So you'll have to start accelerating again or decelerating. So we want to stop. Acceleration of minus one meter per second squared. Okay, and then we'll do everything in reverse. So we'll start up and go down. So part D would be uh, start moving down at one meter per second squared. Part E will be, again, moving at constant velocity. And then part F will be uh, stopping with an acceleration of one meter per second. Okay, so for part A, here's our elevator. And I'm going to draw my velocity over here because it's not, remember, we don't want to draw velocities in our free body diagram. So we'll have our normal force pointing up because the box is sitting in the elevator. We'll have some gravitational force pointing down. And those are the only two forces acting on this box. So if we write down our Newton's second law, which is some of the forces, and I will sometimes write it with a Y, uh, especially when we're doing two-dimensional motion, but maybe I'll just leave that out for now. And that equals m a. So in the problem, we were told that this thing, this elevator is accelerating at one meter per second squared upwards. So this acceleration is positive and it has a value of one. So uh, if we want to solve for our normal force, because the right side of the equation isn't zero anymore, the normal force is not gonna be the same as it was when the box was just sitting on the ground. Okay, so we have our normal force minus our gravitational force equals MA. So again, I just put, I made the normal force positive because it's pointing up. If this is the positive Y direction, and then I made the gravitational force negative because it's pointing down. And I made the acceleration uh, positive because we're starting from rest and we're going upwards. Okay, so if I wanted to solve for the normal force, it would be Fg plus Ma. The gravitational force is Mg plus Ma. So this is, so you could factor out the M if you want. And then plugging in our numbers, we said we're just gonna keep M at 10 kilograms throughout. The gravitational acceleration is 9.8. The acceleration of the elevator was one. And so we get 10 times 10.8, which would be 108. Why is the gravity not negative? Because we, uh, so it was negative on the left side, but then we added it to the other side of the equation because we want to isolate the normal force. And so in addition to what you want to do when something is accelerating, 
uh, also just conceptually see that if you're accelerating upwards, your normal force is going to be greater than the normal force that you feel when you're just sit, standing on the ground that's not moving. Okay. So that was the first part. Then maybe I'll sneak the second part in over here. So for part B, we're still, and also this, this free body diagram is gonna be the same for all of the pictures. So the, the only two forces acting on us are normal and gravity. And now our velocity is still upwards, but now we've reached some constant velocity and we're not accelerating anymore. So if we do our sum of the forces again, the right side of the equation is just zero because constant velocity means no acceleration. Then solving for the normal force, we get that it equals the gravitational force. which is the 98 Newtons that we calculated when it was on flat surface, not moving. Ninety-eight, yeah, because we're doing 10 times 9.8. So this is not really necessary for this class, but this is the kind of thinking that uh, Einstein was doing when thinking about special and general relativity. So uh, if you were inside this kind of elevator in space and you didn't have any windows or anything, moving at this constant velocity would feel the same to you as if you were stationary. So if you didn't have any external references to see like stars moving past you through the window or anything, this constant uh, velocity is equivalent to you being stationary. And we see that in our forces, right? The force that we feel is the same as if we were just standing on a, a motionless surface. So that was part A and part B. So part C now, our elevator is approaching the floor that we want to get off at. And so our velocity is still pointing upwards, but now in order to slow down, we need the acceleration to point in the opposite direction. So our acceleration is gonna point down. And so if we do that, some of the forces in the Y, or I guess some of the forces plus MA. Now, the left side of the equation is, always, is just gonna be the same for all of these examples. And then the right side is now negative because our acceleration is pointing in the negative Y direction. So if we want to solve for the normal force, we add the gravitational force to the other side. And that's going to be, there's going to be a minus sign still in front of the acceleration term and plugging in what the force of gravity is and then factoring out that M, we get this equation, which we can plug our values into and we would now get that the normal force of on the box is uh, 88 
So now as you're slowing down in the elevator, you feel like you weigh less than you do if you're standing on the ground that isn't moving. Okay, so then part D, now our elevator is going back down to the ground floor. So the velocity is now down. And in order to start moving in the downward direction, our acceleration also has to be down. Do our sum of the forces again. Normal and gravity are on the left side. Our acceleration is still negative. So we still put a negative sign in front. And then we see that the math all looks the same as it did in part C. That's, so part E was again the, velocity is now down, but our acceleration was zero because we've reached some constant velocity. And so, oops. So we get normal minus gravity equals zero. And again, we get our normal force is just the normal or the rate of force that we feel when we're on the ground. Okay. And then there's one final case. where now the box or the elevator is accelerating. So our velocity was down. If we want to stop moving, what direction would our acceleration need to be in? The up direction. And so our acceleration is positive. So our sum of the forces equation looks like this. Solving for normal again, we add the gravitational force to the other side. And we'll see that the, your normal force that you feel is now greater than it is when you're not moving. So when you're looking at these kind of problems, you need to pay attention to uh, is something moving or is it stationary? If it's stationary, you can just say that all of your accelerations are zero. If something's moving, you need to check, is it moving at a constant velocity or is it accelerating? If it's moving at a constant velocity, then the acceleration is zero. And it's the same kind of setup as what we were just talking about. Uh, but if you have an acceleration, then you need to include it on the right-hand side of your second law equation like we just did. The, in these problems, the velocity is only important to tell you which direction the acceleration is. So like if you look at example, uh, part F, the velocity was down, 
And if we look at part E, the velocity was down, but the normal forces are completely different. So it's the acceleration that determines uh, what normal force you feel, not the velocity. So you, you would use the velocity to determine the direction of the acceleration like in part F, uh, but other than that, the velocity isn't affecting uh, these forces. 